as far as I'm concerned, you are that pot of gold <laughs> at the end of that rainbow. You are so loved and so appreciated. Ah, hi. <laughs> It's me, and I have wanted to say this line for so long now, because I know there's a bit of ham in me. <laughs> to be or not to be, is that really a question? <laughs> you know, for those of you who are familiar with the writings of Shakespeare, you know that I paraphrase that question, which is really uh, to, be, um, to be or not to be. That is the question that Prince Hamlet was pondering in his soliloquy in the opening of the third act. It's long been interpreted that Hamlet was pondering whether or not it was better to be alive or to be dead. And to be quite candid, there have been other people who have thought that same question whether it be when time seemed to be the darkest or, or when you've taken a wrong turn or when you've hit rock bottom or maybe you think there's no way out or no way up. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to circle back to that question. You know, from the mo moment we are born, we are infused with wonder and curiosity, aren't we? Have you ever seen a baby look at their hand for the first time? It's like, wow, <laughs> what is this? What does it do? You know, the world around us is ours to explore. And from the first moment we learn how to talk, one of our favorite one-word question is, why? I ask any parent, they're going to tell you that for sure. Now, the, the problem, I'll be candid, the problem with asking questions is that you might not always get a truthful answer. And there's all sorts of reasons why. It could be because the person who is responding truly believes that what they're telling you is the truth. It could be that someone uh, wants to persuade you to their way of thinking. And then other times, well, it's just because it's easier, it's more comfortable not to tell the truth. You know, that happened to me a while back. I didn't want to tell the truth because it was easier not to. Yes, I know, me, a practitioner, right, who is supposed to live in integrity. Yeah. But I want to explain the circumstances because that's what people who lie do. We want to justify it, you know, so that you're on our side. But it was a while back, and our two of our granddaughters, Amanda and Lauren, were visiting us. And they were about six and four years old at the time. Well, we decided to take them to a working ranch that some friends of ours owned uh, outside of the Paulden area. Well, on this working ranch were a number of critters. I mean, we're talking horses, cattle. We've got at least five or six dogs running around. There's an assortment of cats. They had a couple of goats. They had a donkey. And over by the tack room area was a large wire meshed enclosed area that had a hen coop in there and a number of chickens walking around with a rooster who was keeping a very close eye on his ladies. Well, <clears throat> most of these chickens walking around did not have any feathers from their waist to their tails. And my grandma, right, my granddaughters noticed this. And so they came up to me to ask, why don't these chickens have any feathers from their waist to their tail? And I'm going to share with you, there was absolutely no way I wanted to explain to them about, well, there's no other way to say this, about a randy rooster, <laughs> okay? And so I looked at those two sweet, innocent, trusting faces right in the eye, and I told them, I said, chickens molt. <laughs> and they said, they do? And I said, yeah. I said, they're birds, aren't they? And they go, oh, yeah. You know, to this day, and I told him, I said, if you have any other questions, ask your mommy and daddy. <laughs> you, know, you know, to this day, I truly hope that they never had that question come up on a test. <laughs> so, 
But questions are what make us grow. It, it helps us become more aware, not only of our connection to spirit, but also to our surroundings around us. Um, uh, helping to create what we refer to as that human race consciousness. But even that human race consciousness can be based on an inaccurate conclusion. You know, one of the examples that sometimes is used is that it used to be that the world believed that you could never run a mile under four minutes. That's what the world believed it expected to be true, and that's what it experienced as being true. Until one day, a man by the name of Roger Bannister ran that mile in under four minutes, and all of a sudden, the world had a different belief, a different way of thinking that it accepted. And now the experience is that people all around the globe have run a mile in under four minutes. You know, that's one of the things we teach, isn't it? That if you change your belief, you will have a different experience. That at times we encourage you to let go of your old story so that the universe can write a new one for you. To have your mind open by wonder than to have one closed by belief. Now, I'll be candid for myself. I find sometimes challenges. Sometimes my challenge is to treat others as I would like to be treated or to treat others as they treated me. You know, and, and the thing is the human race consciousness supports the latter. And you, you hear it through statements or slogans. Maybe you yourself have even said it yourself, where we say things, oh yeah, well you can dish it out, but you can't take it. Or I give as good as I get. Have you ever, you know, is the dilemma people? Or is it theology? You know, people are not the same, nor will they ever be the same. You know, is it a world that works for everyone? Or is it a consciousness that works in every situation that leads to a world that works for everyone? You know, my affirmations do not change others. It changes me. God is not coercive. God is persuasive. God does not control all outcomes. God is whispering guidance to us in all situations. We have the freedom of choice, which is the freedom to hurt or the freedom to love. Neither one or as much of both as you choose. <clears throat> you know, I grew up in what was called, I guess you could call it a biblical family. My father was a Quaker, my mom was a Christian scientist, but one of the things they were really good at was whenever a situation came up, they were able to find a biblical quote to match the situation. And of the biblical verses I hated, and trust me, there were many. <laughs> There were many, Let, let's be true of that. Was the one that's actually found in the book of Luke, chapter 14, where it says, to he who much is given, much will be required. You know, I hated that quote. You know, it just proved to me that there's always a catch, right? There's always a hook. It's not like, hey, to he as much as given, Go out, have a good time. You deserve it, you earned it, relax. No, it was the part of much will be required. And I don't know about anybody else, but that sounded like work to me. And personally, I had enough things on my plate, thank you very much. I didn't need to take on any more. But the thing is, as I grew spiritually, I had an opportunity to revisit that quote. And, and what I realized was a new understanding, a new perspective, 
that you and I have been given much. Much has been given. We have been given the opportunity to know spirit in a fresh and cleansing way, unattached to the dogma of sometimes that follows knowing spirit. That we have been given this opportunity of recognizing spirit is all that there is. And we are of its perfection. There are no exceptions. There are no exclusions. There is no separation. None whatsoever. Spirit is divine love. And we are of its divine love. Spirit is life eternal that knows nothing outside itself. And we are of that life eternal. We don't have to hesitate in answering Hamlet's question, to be or not to be, as we recognize the simple truth of our oneness with life eternal, with our oneness with spirit. For no matter what path you are on, all roads lead to home. Any sense of death is just a mortal illusion that has absolutely no truth or no place in God's kingdom. And here's the thing. It's all God's kingdom. That's what we mean when we say God is omnipresent, that God is everywhere. Or as perhaps one of my parents would probably quote at this time from the Bible, 1 Corinthians, they would probably say, O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? And for that last part of the quote, much will be required. Yeah, that's true. Much will be required, for you are being given this opportunity of glimpsing the truth, a bond, a, uh, uh, glimpsing the truth beyond apparent circumstances, beyond the pictures that are being shown to you, to know and recognize that love is always present, that love is always there to be expressed, even in times of displacement or of conflict, that love is present. And you know, the beauty about that, knowing that love is always involved, is in knowing of then who we truly are, that this is the opportunity now that we are the beloved of God, that we are, that that is our true, authentic self. It was Dolly Parton who said, whatever you are, be that. Anything else is just an act. You know, to be or not to be is a growth moment. This is where we get to go, where theology cannot take us. It is the path of the contemplative who must find the reality beyond words and beyond judgment and recognize that this is the possibility for great spiritual growth that is taken here to this moment, this day, in this room. It is not an answer to the experience of no answer that is needed. It is an openness to receive in a way that we have never known before. And in doing so, that makes us even more contemplative. And in turn, that leads to even more spiritual growth. I am reminded of the words of Michelangelo regarding his sculpture of David when they asked him, how did you do it? And he responded, I saw the angel in the marble and carved it, shall I set it free? I saw the angel in the marble, and I carved it until I set it free. You know, that's what I invite you to do. Yeah, to carve that marble 
and set that angel within you free. You know, that's your gift. The gift that you give to each and every one of us, whether it's to sculpt or to paint or to write or to dance or to sing or to dream or to use that sixth sense to imagine something that nobody else can until you set that vision free. Jackson, Queen B share their gift through their music. Clay shares his gift through his poetry, and he is a gifted poet. Nancy, our front office administrator, does it through her creativity that you see on the walls and on the tabletop and in her office. Bob, with his gifts of signing. Christine Pirro, who made these beautiful earrings for me that are our teaching symbol here people sharing their gifts. And so I invite you to see that angel within the marble within you and to carve it until you set it free. You know, today we celebrate. Today is a great day to be alive, to be open into receiving in a way that we have never experienced before, to be present to be, to share your wondrous gifts with this world, to step into your greatness. You are loved. Relax into the infinite that created you. You are divinely authorized to be. And so I'm going to ask that you please say this affirmation with me. Today, I carve out the angel within me. Today, I step into my greatness. I am loved. I relax into the infinite that created me to be. And let's say that one more time. Today, I carve out the angel within me. Today, I step out into my greatness. I am loved. I relax into that infinite that created me to be. And so with that, let's go ahead and go into prayer. As I know right now, for we know in this moment that infinite presence. We right now are basking in that energy of all that is, that infinite source, the energy that is within this room, within each and every individual person, that this great I am is who we are that we are its embodiment of ourself, of itself, that we are not separate, that we are one with it, that we are divinely authorized into being, expressing that love, expressing that peace, that we are joy-filled, knowing our true authentic self. We recognize that we are of its perfection, that God is in every moment, that we breathe in that breath of God that nourishes our body, that provides us all that we need and more. And when we have taken our fill, then we exhale it, knowing now that we are the divine activity of spirit itself going forward. I know in this moment that each and every person is infused with love, with joy, with peace, waiting to just share their wondrous gifts in this world. That this gift within them is already being refilled, that they are carving out that angel within the marble and they're setting it free knowing that they are 
the divine expression. And so as such, when people sometimes ask, well, is it to be or can I be free to be me? It's that it's one and the same. One and the same. For God is delighting through us. God is experiencing itself through us. We are here in this moment, reflecting all the goodness, all the joy of love. And so I am so grateful knowing this. Basking in this present, knowing that it's providing clarity, knowing that it's providing direction, knowing that it is whispering guidance to us in every single moment. As we step forward, claiming who we are, that true authentic self, of God's beloved child. Yes, we are loved, we are loving, and we are lovable. And so I embrace this truth. I relax in this truth. I bask in this truth, centered in alignment of knowingness. This moment of spiritual growth, receiving in a way that we have never received before. And we are open, so open, in experiencing all of God's gifts. And so I give thanks for it. I am so grateful for knowing this truth, for this much that will be required, for this is the true gift. The much will be required for it. So thank you, life. Thank you, God. Thank you for all there is. And now all I do is I release it into that, what we at times refer to as the universal law. But it is our servant who can only respond yes. And I anchor that by saying, and so it is. And now to please stand. Thank you, Jackson, as well. This is one of the wonderful things in being a member of this center is knowing so many different ways of understanding our oneness with all that is. And in this moment, knowing that, we also recognize the much will be required part can include financial contribution, sharing those gifts that you have in supporting this center in maintaining this physical space so that people can come and bask with us 
and knowing who we are and knowing our oneness with each other and sharing that consciousness of a, that works in every situation. And so I invite you to take your love offering. Maybe you've already given. For those of you who are watching online, being shown on screen, is how you can donate either on our website or either by texting the information. And for those of you here, perhaps you've already given your donation. And even if you have, I'm going to ask that you still join us with this. Because I'm going to ask that you take your donation. This abundance, this love circulation that is now occurring. And feel it against your heart. That heartbeat. The heartbeat of God. Ah, blessing it with your presence with your energy and I invite you to say this with me divine love in and through me blesses and multiplies all that I have all that I give and all that I receive thank you life and you may put your donation in the offering box outside the sanctuary